Hey folks, Jeff Kozlowski here with another episode of the K-Stream Podcast coming your way. Another two-time guest on the show this time around. We have Anthony Barocas. He is the founder of Stream For Us. They are a video production, uh, multimedia, live streaming company based in Texas. He's been in the game 20 plus years, really knows his stuff, knows every format, every type of production you can think of when it comes to video, does a ton of equipment reviews, does a ton of remote productions, in-person productions. I mean, he's got a ton of experience under his belt. And he was last on the show in February 2021 talking remote production. We were kind of in the height of remote event, all virtual production due to COVID. And we talked a lot about cloud production. So, you know, here we are, May 2022, a lot's changed, and I wanted to have Anthony back on the show to kind of talk about what work looks like for him these days and, and what's been going on. So uh, without further ado, let's get into it with Anthony. All right, Anthony Barocas, thank you so much for joining me again. It's it's a pleasure to see you. How are you? I'm really good. Thank you uh, for, the, for the opportunity to be back. It's, it's always good to talk with you. I know you've got a, a wealth of experience um especially speaking to many people in the field whereas you know i'm just doing i'm in my own lane type of thing well i i'm excited to talk about that specific lane though because last time we talked it was february 2021 and as we record this now in may of 2022 lots of time has passed lots of things have changed uh in in the world in a broader sense as well as event production um so you know, last time we spoke, you were very much in the remote production world. I guess anybody that produced events really was in the midst of the pandemic. So here we are, May 2022. You know, what's what's changed since then? And, and what does work for you these days look like? <laughs> I, I think of that one scene from uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark where Indiana Jones is hanging them on the tank and the guy leans over the guy who's driving the tank and he's like, go this way. And it's literally, it's been like, you know, <laughs> like there's been this massive, you know, I don't want to say pivot because God, that term is overused, but yeah. like, you know, a pendulum has swung. It went all the way to remote and now it is swinging all the way back. And if anything, I think, you know, looking at the years before COVID, there was a natural progression to including more people remotely. There was a natural progression to um companies leveraging streaming you know but it it was a subset it was you know like 20 30 percent of the companies would you know stream things if they had multiple offices across the country and then when COVID hit everybody had to like go that way but then now it's like everybody is so tired of doing that and you know admittedly it is hard work it is difficult to do a hybrid event because if you're doing an event for people in person and also trying to manage an experience for people uh, in the cloud that's double the work and it's hard and event planners i can definitely see that they were like you know let's just focus on the in-person event let's get this right let's do this let's have a good event and let's just focus on that and i've seen a lot of clients um, you know, for example, last year I was brought in as head of streaming for DHD films in Dallas and I was managing, you know, a, in one week, you know, we did five different clients. Um, that was a really busy week. But mm -hmm. since then, you know, I've since moved it back out on my own because their, uh, in-house production for streaming has been re reduced markedly because so many clients have gone back to in-person events and just basically says, you know, we're not going to stream this thing. We want it to be in person. We want it to be inclusive. We want people to come and have face to face and everything. So if anything, they're actually swinging further back mm -hmm. and saying, we deliberately don't want to have streaming because we don't want to have people continue to stay at home and not be involved with things. We want them back. And I think it has actually gone past the 30%, you know, I was like, maybe we're back down to 10% people who are streaming. And I think that's, that's what I've seen in my, in my business. There are still streaming clients. There are still streaming work out there, 
Um, I was, you know, just did a thing for Wells Fargo. They had a big event. And, you know, so there are companies that are, that is still part of what they do. It is still part of, you know, their mindset. You know, COVID may have made it a greater percentage, but they didn't swing all the way back the opposite way and do even less. And you do mainly corporate events. Is that right? Yes, I, I do mostly corporate work. Um, and then, you know, the occasional like nonprofit event type of thing. Um, but I don't do like episodic programming. I don't do, um, like a music variety show or, you know, I don't, I don't create my own content. I'm, I mainly brought in for corporate work. Yeah. And the, the clients now that are just saying, you know, we want to do this, we're doing this event fully on site no streaming are p are, are they still like doing some sort of video element i mean are they still like they want the event maybe recorded or like full you know a nice nicely produced video just not interested in the streaming aspect yeah i think there's you know for those of us who do it we understand the difference between doing a hybrid event which is including the remote audience in the mm -hmm. local show and streaming which is basically like broadcast television where you have an audience and you're pushing it they could watch it they can do their own little commentary but they're not part of the local show and i think whereas before things that were being streamed then became hybrid now i think a lot of uh, companies have gone either back to just streaming or like I says, went so far back that they actually want people not to stream it. They want people to show up in person. Although I have an event coming up. I was doing a site visit today where it's uh, a local um, American Marketing Association uh, annual awards banquet. And they understand that some people still aren't prepared to come back to big 200 people in a room type of things. Mm -hmm. um, that's why NAB was a much smaller show this year because there's still a large group of people around the world who are not fully on board with, hey, let's dive in here and you know mingle because it's all gone. Because in reality, it's not all gone. Mm -hmm. It's just that you know uh, so many people have gotten vaccines and and it reduces the transmission rate and you know. I think they said it's endemic as opposed to pandemic. I'm not a doctor, you know, so <laughs> I don't want to get into that. But I think um, there are still a group of people out there and they says, well, we want people to come. Yes. And we're expecting a lot of people to come. Um, but we're going to make a streaming ticket available. It's still going to be, you know, a, a, a much smaller cost because you're not paying for the whole building and room and food and everything. But we still, you know, want it to be a fundraiser for the organization. Mm -hmm. So that way um, they're able to see the event, sort of like be a part of the event, like anybody who watches any of the live, you know, variety shows or uh, like, you know, American Idol or The Voice or anything like that. And you can vote and, you know, you, you feel like you're part of the event. Um, and then the next day you can all talk about it like you were there. Hey, mm -hmm. congratulations on this. I saw you, you know, you know, get your award last night. And but they didn't have to, like, travel and, you know brave the crowds as it were that's mm -hmm. it's, it's hybrid just sounds you know it sounds tough we we um you know i think throughout the pandemic when when hybrid seemed to be you know that was like the way events were going to go Every, you know hybrid was here to stay and um the, the key for like those hybrid event producers was we got to do our best to make the virtual attendee have as much as you can an equal experience to those in person i mean that just it's that's just got to be so difficult right it, it is a challenge definitely especially if you're an event producer and you're trying to have a real experience in the room and also kind of involve and give the remote audience an experience. It's it, you're, you're basically doing two events yeah. in two completely different types of media. And that is a real challenge that, you know, that is not going to argue that that is hard. And, you know, I can definitely see people saying, listen, I'm, I'm glad to not have to be, have to be doing that anymore. And we can focus on the in-person event. Absolutely. And, um, I, last time we spoke, I know you were 
very, you were big on you were you were using vmix you were using i know streamyard was a um a, a tool you were using a lot i know i remember reading an article um that you wrote about about a uh, remote event you produced using streamyard so what um what other tools software are you do you find yourself using these days well i'm still using the same tools although the the big event I was just brought in to work on was a TriCaster event. You know, we had dual TriCasters, primary and, and backup, feeding a remote audience that was not able to attend the event, but the event had, you know, hundreds, if, if not, you know, 1,500 people in the room. It was a massive um, auditorium. And, you know, they still wanted to have that aspect for people, you know, either at remote locations, couldn't travel, family obligations, wh whatever, you know, everybody has different reasons. And, you know, that wasn't a huge audience, but it was something they still wanted to make available. So, you know, and I think companies that were doing that before COVID are kind of the companies that are still going to be doing that after COVID because that is part of their mindset mm. to have that available because they understand everybody has stuff going on and not everybody's able to make the annual banquet because of whatever's going on at home. You know, it's like, oh, my mother's sick. I have to be here to, you know, take care of her. I cannot leave for three days, you know, but I can attend the daytime events if they're streamed, you know, mm -hmm. type of thing. And they made it, you know, it was just a stream, it was one way, but they made sure to also include those people who won awards but weren't present, they included them in the presentation. So their face was up on stage and they were mentioned by name, even if they weren't walking across the stage and accepting an award. So I think that's really important too, is, you know, if, you know, you're not going fully hybrid, but also to make sure that those people are included in some way. Yeah, so it's, you know, I think that's it, an interesting point. Like if anything, you know, I, I think kind of the pandemic taught us or taught, you know, event producers maybe how to better incorporate stuff like maybe a keynote speaker can't make it um, last minute. Well, we've got some really cool ways to bring in their video or bring them into the event live that we didn't have before. Or, you know, we, we it's, it's common now, like you said, to um there are uh pricing and ticketing options for those uh attending virtually they get this experience they pay less because they're not there it's just i think it's you know we at least are prepared for very much more prepared for for situations like that now so it's i mean you know were you are you were you kind of um though you know given all that were you kind of surprised that the like you said, the the full pendulum shift back to 100% in person, or were you kind of along the way getting the sense like these, you know, these people are going to be eager to do this again? I have a third option. No. Um, you, and it's related to the tools, because when we started the pandemic at the beginning of 2020, you know, the streaming tools were there, but hybrid tools were difficult. Mm -hmm. Um, but in the intervening two years, the ability to do hybrids has evolved dramatically. You know, yeah. um, Hopin purchased StreamYard and Zoom created their own event platform. Vimeo created their own event platform. Uh, other third party event platforms uh, uh, were developed and are growing rapidly or were growing rapidly. And I, I've even seen you know, I was working on an article where a company who was doing streaming and then doing hybrid, but they found a way to leverage Teams and their AV centers and the way Teams had evolved that they could have the AV room be a participant in Teams mm -hmm. and thereby they could actually switch the cameras and microphones in the room they fed the remote audience, but because the room was actually like their laptop, they could bring the remote person speaking onto the screen in the room, essentially delivering the full hybrid experience <laughs> with almost zero extra hardware. And, you know, that's the, the tools evolved. And I kind of saw things going like, wow, this has become so easy. You don't need vMix or a TriCaster or anything to be able to do a full hybrid experience because now Teams let you 
pin three people across. And Teams lets you put those that three people across up on the screen in the room. And so the people in the room and the people who are remote are both involved and they're both seeing the same show. I was like, this is kind of like uh, the third way that I didn't see things at the beginning. But I was like, wow, this is this is really enabling. But at the same time, now that we're all coming back into the office and everything, is that going to be needed? And um, I kind of think Zoom answered that recently because Zoom sent out an email, whereas at the beginning of the pandemic, it was like Zoom came out of nowhere. I, I hadn't heard of it before COVID. Um, and then they were like the solution for everybody, basically because it was like, if you need one-on-one, -on -one, it's free. Or, you know, if you need two or three people, it's free. But then after 40 minutes, you know, then you can sign up for a plan. And I think since the beginning of 2022, there's been such a precipitous drop off in subscriptions that Zoom just sent out an email that as of May 3rd, two more days, anybody having a conversation, even one on one, longer than 40 minutes is going to have to sign up for a paid plan. So they're, mm -hmm. I, I, they're scrambling for dollars at this point. And they're like, you know, oh my goodness, you know, so we're going to make, you know, people who need a one hour face to face, we're, they're going to need to pay now. And I'm like, no, they're just going to go to FaceTime or, you know, Facebook Messenger or WeChat or, you know, any number of one on one solutions that don't cost any money. But I think that really demonstrated from a service end that they're seeing a precipitous drop off in usage and subscriptions and people are just really like flocking back together. That's so interesting. And, and um, another piece we talked about last time was cloud production and, you know, like tools like StreamYard and, and Restream and, and stuff like that, where, um, you know, everything is kind of housed in the cloud, not necessarily hardware or anything like that. I mean, those had a place for a long time. Are, are they going to have a place moving forward? I mean, specific to event production that is that is a really interesting question <laughs> <laughs> i mean you you actually speak with more people that, than you know in different fields than i do i'd be curious what you've heard you know me personally um in event production usually an event is at one location and you've got multiple cameras in the room so yeah. having a local switch really is kind of necessary if your event is very spread out, like a marathon or something like that, I could see multiple people dialing in to a cloud production and being yep. switched in the cloud. Um, but yeah, you know, the problem with cloud production is you really don't have it. It makes it difficult to manage the crew because then you also have to have cloud communications in addition to the cloud cameras. And, and yeah you know, you're sort of doubling up your, your cloud systems. And if something isn't working right, there's really not a lot you can do. Yeah, that's, I think, you know, the folks I've talked to some, what's interesting is a lot of, I think, uh, like in the sports industry, like, you know, certain sports productions, they are um, able to produce, you know, full, full shows, full football games, um, with people in different locations around the world, um, you know, uh, uh, producing one event. So, you know, I think like you said, in, in certain instances, it can, it'll still come in handy. Like maybe if, if people are, um, spread out all over the place, but yeah, maybe, uh, I guess at the same time, I guess they weren't necessarily built for that in-person experience anyway. I mean, it's, they're, it's, tools like that are great for interviews like we're doing or um you know to, so to, uh platforms like you know linkedin and and um twitter other other social media networks i mean they there is certainly a place for simple live streamed q and a's and or you know very very simple um interview or panel discussion type events where i think those tools will will certainly have a place, but yeah, just maybe not in the, you know, larger big picture or uh, in person event sense. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you for for when you're dealing with person to person, 
you know, a discussion, a panel event, you know, I definitely think those cloud tools, especially if the, the people who are talking are, you know, in different locations, it saves the travel and everything else and, and makes uh, interviews, more types of interviews and more people available than would normally be available if you were limited to a certain physical spot. Um, and then, you know, the other concerns you have, like if you're doing a sporting event and, you know, people are saying, well, I can save a lot of money from, you know, having to bring a, you know, production truck onto location to do this thing. It costs a lot of money. Whereas if we can just send the cameras back, but then, you know, this is the little thing that people seem to gloss over is like, well, if you want to send high quality video from eight cameras at the stadium back you kind of need a production truck there <laughs> to be able to handle that bandwidth and make sure you have multiple reliable connections to the internet with that bandwidth, you know, so that all of a sudden the, you know, the production center in New York City and the graphics operator in Atlanta and the sportscasters in their homes are all able to, you know, see and hear the feed and do what they need to do. You know, whereas if, if that internet connection is um, a little rough, then, you know, all of a sudden it's sort of like, well, I wish we had the production truck on the site because then we could still take it in and record it and then broadcast it at a later date. Right. And what's interesting is I know, and of course these are schools and teams that have the money to do stuff like that is I think they're, you know, the certain places now are building their own in-house production room or whatever um that maybe has that capability um but yeah you're right i, I think uh, that's that's clearly not not the case for um many schools and teams that just you know you don't they don't have the money for stuff like that and the productions are going to suffer but um yeah it'll be you know it'll be um interesting to see kind of where things go in the specifically in the sports world but um want to go just quickly back to equipment we uh before the before the recording you mentioned you are um testing out yolo box and i've seen uh i think a, a video you've you've done on that i would love to know your thoughts on it because i am you know when i saw you review it that was i think it feels like it's been a while now and you were the first and only person i saw kind of playing with that for for quite a while and now lately some of these folks that I follow that do more like the live shopping stuff and, and um, you know, those kinds of like Amazon live broadcasts or whatnot there. I've seen more of them talking about Yolo box. So I'm curious, you know, can you just talk quickly about what that is and, and you know, what um, your thoughts on it are? Well, you know, years ago in 2017, it was, I actually picked up an iPad and I started using switcher studio which is an iOS tablet based live switching platform. And over the intervening years, Switcher Studio was joined by Teradek Live to Air, which is now Airmix, uh, mm. Cinemaker, and now Top Director. And you could kind of count Panasonic in there, but the Panasonic app only works with Panasonic cameras. So technically there's four open apps and they're all iPad based. And everybody keeps going, why is there no Android app? Why is there no Android app? Well because there's so many different Android tablet manufacturers and so many different, you know, um, camera modules and everything. It's just really, really hard to code, you know, in essence, it's way easier for a person writing code to write for an Apple device because Apple takes care of Apple handles the camera. You basically have to say camera do this and not have to deal with the 16 different camera modules that were used through the years. Mm -hmm. Apple takes it, you know, takes care of all that. And, you know, you, you can on one hand, you can say, well, they're taking the easy way up. But on the other hand, they're able to spend more time on the app and not having to deal with all these technical issues. Um, the Yolo box is actually an Android tablet, you know, but it is, you know, ground up designed for switching physical inputs. That's the other really di neat differentiation in that um, the iPad apps are usually designed so that your cameras are on the network somewhere, whether they be an iPhone using the app that come in across a Wi-Fi network. Mm -hmm. And you know, the number one question I see in the Switcher Studio group is, well, how do I connect my DSLR? 
Yeah. And the number one answer is you don't. <laughs> and then of course somebody's always going to chime in. Yeah, but you can like take the DSLR oh. and then use USB capture into your laptop and then use the screen capture on the laptop. To I'm like, boy, that's a really weird, we're a wonky walk around. Yeah, yeah. And the Yolo box, the, the, you know, they they were the Kickstarter uh, with the original Yolo box, which I don't have in front of me. Um, and they have physical inputs. So the original uh, Yolo box has two HDMI inputs and a USB input. So you could use a USB webcam like I'm using right here as a wide shot and then add an HDMI camera as a close up and switch. Mm -hmm. And they're able to do this in an Android tablet. It has to be a pretty decent Android tablet because they're doing live titles, um, streaming and recording and live switching. So whatever the format that comes in, it could be 720p, it could be 1080i. You determine what the project frame size is and frame rate, and it's going to convert all those inputs to your project. So there's a bunch of stuff going on in the app, and then it's going to compress it and send it out. And I've been pretty impressed with it. In my review, I one of the things that impressed me most was the fact that the people who you know were involved with the Kickstarter are still involved with the project, are still in the user group and when somebody says this is a problem you'll see them hmm. you know frank and the other people you'll see them write replies hey can you send us uh, a video clip can you can we you know and asking for more information on it and they're very involved with adding updates and you know making changes you know so early on you know the things that i says oh that you know you, you can only use one source at a time and the titles are named incorrectly and, and other things all that stuff's been you know fixed. Now you've got a real live audio mixer. So you can have three different sources going and you determine what the volumes are for each of those things. Um, they've, you know, they're tweaking little things. They've added green screen. They've mm -hmm. added other capabilities. So that's one of the things that really impressed me the most with it was that their involvement and, you know, every couple weeks there's an update mm -hmm. and, you know, you can't quite say the same about some of the, you know, other projects that are out there, you know, maybe even Sling Studio. I, I haven't heard mm -hmm. of somebody using Sling Studio in a long time. I'm not saying it's a bad product, but I don't hear much of it in any of the streaming groups that I'm in. So, you know, I think the Yolo box, especially because it's all built into a tablet and you can put the tablet on top of your camera, you know, so it's like I've got my video camera with the 20X lens and I've mm -hmm. got my streaming device. Oh, and it's got cellular built in. So you put your SIM card in and you basically, let's say, push to um, YouTube and Facebook and Twitch all at the same time because they even give you multicasting capability mm -hmm. through their service, which is included. I mean, you know, it, the, the package that they put together is, is just a very enticing package. You know, I'm not going to see, you know, corporate use it very much. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I definitely see, like you said, you know, um, online sales and things like that really getting into it. And at NAB, they actually introduced two new products specifically for um, sales and marketing like Instagram and, and Twitch and things like that. Interesting. And, and everything can be done with the one device, right? You don't need to download extra software on any other devices, right? I mean, everything is, is just there. Everything is there. Like the differentiation would be that there is no software to download. So if you wanted to use another phone as a remote camera wirelessly, you can't. Right. <laughs> because this this app doesn't have it because it has physical inputs on the box. So unless your camera is coming in via HDMI or USB, mm -hmm. then your your camera is not coming in. There there is an RTSP. But, you know, even that, you know, I, I remember early on somebody was like, well, you can send your GoPro wirelessly to an RS, RS, TP, whatever, you know, server. So it then gets echoed over to the YOLO box. And, you know, that's going to introduce a couple frames of delay in and of itself. So, you know, it's still, you know, like using a DSLR on an iPad, it's you're, you're going the wonky workaround. It's so interesting that how you know, you, like you mentioned the questions you see in different Facebook groups or, or whatever group communities um, that were built around specific tools and softwares, the, the, you know, I think people forget a lot of times just like what these tools were meant to do. Like, you know, it's, 
like you said, with Switcher Studio, it's so you do see frequently people asking like, well, how do I, how do I plug a DSLR in or how do I get, um, I don't know, something that I, I think the, the traditional Switcher Studio user isn't, you're not, that's not what necessarily Switcher Studio was built to do. You know, it's, I think it's easy for, or, or at least you just see so many folks are trying to think of workarounds to certain, um, certain issues that they're having with one specific tool, but Maybe they're just. Maybe this isn't the right tool. Maybe you know, if you if you want to plug in your DSLR, I mean, you need to. Why don't you? You should probably go look at the Yolo box. And um, it, so many. It seems like so many more affordable options are popping up out there that you just need to find kind of the right, you know, the right mix of features uh, and capabilities for yourself. Yeah, yeah, I I agree with you. And when people ask, I, I tell them, you know. You know, they're like, well, you've got VMix and a TriCaster. Why do you? Why are you interested in the Yolo box? I'm like, you know, it's one of the tools in the toolbox. Yeah. You know, it's like I got a Phillips head, I got a flat head, yeah. I got pliers, I got a wrench. They all are different tools, and they all have different strengths. You know, if I need yeah. to bring in eight remote people, I'm not going to use my TriCaster. I'm going to use VMix. If yep. I need to like go to a different city and I have to hire a local operator, I may prefer to bring the TriCaster because they have certified operators across the country. And I could just, you know, look on that list, hire a certified operator and know that they are going to know this, you know, thing in and out and be able to handle the show. Um, you know, if you've got a DSLR, there's certain tools that work with that. If you, you know, honestly though, the Yolo box, we were working that corporate show, we were in teams and it was like, you know, we have this, we're in a conference room and it would have been nice if we had this like wide shot, you know, they, mm -hmm. they had um, an A10 mini and they were switching two cameras and then feeding that into the HDMI in the room. Mm -hmm. So that we were taking over the camera in the room with our input so we could switch between a close up and a wide shot. But the wide shot wasn't wide enough. And I was like, you know, if I had the Yolo box, I could use a webcam super wide yeah. and an HDMI camera and because all I need to do is switch between two things, but one of the things that lets me switch between is a wide angle 1080p webcam. And so that would have been the right tool for that job as opposed to the A10 Mini. You know, it's not like, you know, like you said, we were trying to make the A10 Mini do what we wanted it to do, but the cameras couldn't get far enough back <laughs> because it was a small conference room. And it's like, man, a webcam would be like super wide. Yep. Yep. Well, no, I, I, Anthony, this has all um, been excellent. Um, appreciate you coming back on. You know, is there is there anything left? You know, before we started recording, I I had mentioned, um, you know, that I I wasn't sure if I was gonna uh, include this in in the recording or not, but I, it might be an interesting one to end on. It's just, but and maybe it's just for you know a a quick discussion for you know, event producers, because I think I get some folks listening to the podcast that are in event production or, or just video producers in general looking um, to always, I guess, expand their knowledge. So I'm sure over the last couple of years, uh, there were plenty of businesses started up strictly based on streaming, remote, remote streaming. Um, and, you know, those folks now may be looking at the shift in uh you know, the way events are going and thinking, oh, crap, you know, I, I, I need to uh, maybe I need to add some tools to my toolbox or expand my offerings a little bit, you know, is is um, is is that, you know, this may be an easy yes, but like is is this, you know, streaming business or the, the I guess the traditional way of thinking about a, a live streaming business, is that here to stay or I guess you know, is it always, is it just like, as, as events change, your business, I guess, in the video production world is always going to need to evolve with it, right? Um, I'd just be curious your, your take on that. I, I think, I think you, you know, I, I agree with you that it's evolving. Um, if, if one thing you could say, the gold rush of remote events, I think that's pretty much over. Uh, and everybody who jumped in because, oh my goodness, there's just so much work. Yeah, well, all that work kind of like quashed out. Zoom itself is like, oh my God, where did all the money go? You know? 
And, you know, if that's so that's the sign, you know, that um, they're scrambling for dollars. Uh, I bet you there's a lot of people who jumped into this thinking, you know, oh, my goodness, this is the best thing ever. And now we're all like, oh, my goodness, where did all the money go? But remember, there were a lot of people doing streaming production and events before COVID. Mm -hmm. That was actually a thing. And it just so happened that when COVID hit, it, it, the, the business quadrupled, tentupled, whatever, you know, because anybody who needed to do something had to consider and include remote audiences. Um, and now that requirement is pretty much going away. So I think, like I said, the pendulum is swinging back the other way and it may go even you know, further. So now there's a little bit less, but I also think it may correct itself because a lot of the people who didn't give streaming a consideration before COVID, they were like, no, 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 we don't need to do that. There's no reason for that. It's like the same companies that were saying, well, no, we can't have re people work remotely. That doesn't work. Well, two years of remote work proved that people can do remote work. And I think it also demonstrated to people that streaming is inclusive. Streaming can bring in bigger audiences. Streaming can, you know, get your, you know, what you want to say, what you want to show, you know, with, whether you want to educate, motivate, entertain to a larger audience. There's a reason we have broadcast and the Internet is just a different method of broadcast. So I think the opportunity hasn't gone away. You know, the gold rush of easy opportunity is has really gone down, sort of like Lake Powell and, you know, Hoover <laughs> Dam. But <laughs> I think, you know, there is still opportunity out there. And if you have proven yourself and you have, you know, work to show, then, you know, being able to market yourself with those things that you have done will help you you know, get new work. All right. Well, I think that's a, a perfect one to end on. Anthony, thank you so much again for coming back on the show. There are very few two-time guests on, on this one, at least, uh, you know, at least as, as of May, 2022. So, um, it, it was a pleasure having you on again. Hey, I, I appreciate, you know, watching your podcast and learning from other people. Cause like I said, you know, I, I do my work. I'm in my lane. But, you know, the, the great thing about what you do is the, you're getting these insights from people in different lanes and in different cities and, in you know, different, you know, somebody's on a bicycle on grass, you know, you talk about different lanes. Um, so it, it, it is really interesting to, to follow the insights that you're bringing to the table and that your guests, your other guests are bringing to the table. Well, I certainly appreciate that. It's always nice to hear. Um that kind of feedback and, and appreciate you, you listening. And um, who knows? I mean, as the way things change, Anthony, we'll, we'll likely have you on at one at some point again. <laughs> there's, there's far other people, you know, out there that have great stories to tell. <laughs> All right. Thank you. I appreciate it.